We've got a wash, according according to my calculations. We have a wash, and we go to uh, Mr. Perot for one minute. In other words, the violation of the rule. That's what I meant, Mr. Perot. So I'm the only one that's untarnished at this point. All right, you're okay. clear. You're clear. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sure I'll do it before it's over. <laughs> Key thing here, see, we all come up with images. Images don't fix anything. I think, you know, I'm starting to understand it. You stay around this long enough, you think about it, if you, t you, you, if you talk about it in Washington, you think you did it. If you've been on television about it, you think you did it. What we need is people to stop talking and start doing. Now, our real problem here is they have both have plans that will not work. Ross Perot, October 19th, 1992, on stage with President George Bush and Bill Clinton, the last debate of the 1992 presidential campaign, and the last debate since then, which included a third participant, an independent candidate. In 2024, independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is trying to get the spot that Ross Perot got, a third independent candidate in a presidential debate. Kennedy is trying to get in the June 27th debate with Donald Trump and Joe Biden, the first ever televised debate with two people who have been president. And that gives us an opportunity to do this, to remember the last time a general election presidential debate had three people. In this episode of C-SPAN's Podcast Weekly, we go back three decades ago and relive Ross Perot's greatest moments from the 1992 presidential debates. There were three debates during the 1992 general presidential campaign. October 11th at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, moderated by Jim Lehrer. October 15th at the University of Richmond, moderated by Carol Simpson. And October 19th at Michigan State University, moderated again by Jim Lehrer. Before we hear from Ross Perot, some debate milestones from 1992. It wasn't the first time an independent candidate was included in a presidential debate, but it's still the most recent. Ross Perot is the only non-major party candidate ever to participate in a debate sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. The upcoming debate, which Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wants to join, is hosted by CNN. It featured the first ever presidential debate in a town hall format, the second one at the University of Richmond. And it was the first presidential election with at least three debates since 1960, when there were four between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Plus, one important general milestone about 1992. Ross Perot was the first ever general election presidential candidate who paid for his own campaign. He talked about being a self-funded candidate in the third debate. I'm spending my money on this campaign. The two parties are spending your money, taxpayer money. I, I've put my wallet on the table for you and your children. Over $60 million at least will go into this campaign to leave the American dream to you and your children to get this country straightened out, because if anybody owes it to you, I do. I've lived the American dream. I'd like for your children to be able to live it too. Go Governor does... Uh... And by the way, it wasn't until 16 years later that a major party nominee declined public funding. In 2008, Barack Obama became the first Democrat or Republican to forego taxpayer reimbursement of campaign expenses. Also from 2008, John McCain was the last major party nominee to accept public funds for the general election. In 1992, Ross Perot was accused of having no experience to be president. Here's how he responded in the first debate. Well, they've got a point. I don't have any experience in running up a $4 trillion debt. <laughs> I don't have any experience in gridlock government where nobody takes responsibility for anything and everybody blames everybody else. I don't have any experience in creating the worst public school system in the industrialized world, or the most violent crime-ridden society in the industrialized world, but I do have a lot of experience in getting things done. So if we're at a point in history where we want to stop talking about it and do it, I've got a lot of experience in figuring out how to solve problems, making the solutions work, and then moving on to the next one. I've got a lot of experience in not taking 10 years to solve a 10-minute problem. So if it's time for action, I think I have experience that counts. If there's more time for gridlock and talk and finger pointing, I'm the wrong man. In the second debate, the town hall, a citizen asked the candidates to focus on the issues and not the personalities and the mud. Ross Perot responded this way. No hedges, no ifs, ands, and buts. I'll take the pledge because I know the American people want to talk about issues and not tabloid journalism. So I'll take the pledge and we'll stay on the issues. Now, just for the record, uh, I don't have any spin doctors. I don't have any speech writers. 
probably shows. <laughs> I make those charts you see on television even. That shows. Now, but you don't have to wonder if it's me talking. Say, what you see is what you get. If you don't like it, you got two other choices, right? Another topic raised by a citizen at the town hall debate, education. You need small schools, not big schools. A little school, everybody's somebody. Individualism is very important. These big factories, everybody told me they were cost effective. I did a study on it, they're cost ineffective. 5,000 students, why is a high school that big? One reason. Sooner or later, you get 11 or more boys that can run like the devil that weigh 250 pounds and they might win district. Now that has nothing to do with learning. Secondly, across Texas, typically half the school day was non-academic pursuits. In one place, it was 35%. In Texas, you could have unlimited absences to go to livestock shows. Found a boy, excuse me, but you got, this gives the flavor. Boy in Houston kept a chicken in the bathtub in downtown Houston. Missed 65 days going to livestock shows. Finally had to come back to school. The chicken lost his feathers. That's the only way we got him back. <laughs> now, that's your tax money being wasted. And one more from that 1992 town hall. A citizen asked if, one day, a woman would appear on a presidential ticket. Here's Ross Perot's exchange with debate moderator Carol Simpson. Absolutely. What about a woman? Well, oh, oh, I, I told you, <laughs> my candidate's back there. Okay, I, I, I can think of many. Many? Uh, absolutely. When? <laughs> All right, so, how about Sandra Day O'Connor as Good. an example? Mm -hmm. Dr. Bernadine Healy. Good. National Institute of Health. All right, I'll yield the floor. Oh, Name some more. The topic of women came up in the third debate, too. But in terms of being influenced by women and being a minority, there they are right out there, my wife and my four beautiful daughters, and I just have one son, so he and I are surrounded by women giving us, not telling us what to do all the time. Legalization of drugs was discussed in the first debate. Anytime you think you want to legalize drugs, go to a neonatal unit if you can get in. They're between 100 and 200 percent capacity up and down the East Coast. And the reason is crack babies being born. Babies in the hospital 42 days. Typical cost to you and me is $125,000. Again and again and again, the mother disappears in three days. And the child becomes a ward of the state because he's permanently and genetically damaged. Just look at those little children. And if anybody can even think about legalizing drugs, they've lost me. Now let's look at priorities. You know, we went on the Libyan raid. Remember that one? because we were worried to death that Gaddafi might be building up chemical weapons. We've got chemical warfare being conducted against our children on the streets in this country all day, every day, and we don't have the will to stamp it out. And again, if I get up there, if you send me, we're going to have some blunt talks about this, and we're really going to get out in the trenches and say, is this one you want to talk about or fix? Because talk won't do it, folks. There are guys that couldn't get a job third shift in a Dairy Queen driving BMWs and Mercedes selling drugs. And these old boys are not going to quit easy. Right. And in the third debate, they talked about Arkansas because Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas. Mr. Perot, if you were sitting at home now and just heard this exchange about Arkansas, who would you believe? I grew up five blocks from Arkansas. <laughs> let's, let's put it in perspective. It's a beautiful state. It's a fairly rural state. It has a population less than Chicago or Los Angeles, or about the size of Dallas and Fort Worth combined. So I think probably we're making a mistake night after night after night to cast the nation's future on a unit that small. Why is that a mistake? It's irrelevant. What hit? <laughs> Well, yes, I, he, I would. I, I am, what he did as governor of Arkansas no, is irrelevant. No, no, but you can't. You, I could say, you know, that I ran a small grocery store on the corner. Therefore, I extrapolate that into the fact that I could run Walmart. That's not true. <laughs> Mr. Crow, governor. I carefully picked an Arkansas company, you notice there, governor. Right. In 1992, the centerpiece topic for Ross Perot was the national debt. It was a key motivator for his candidacy. In 1992, the national debt was $4 trillion, a quadrupling from the previous year. Today, in 2024, the national debt is $34 trillion. Here's Ross Perot from the second debate. But I just find it fascinating that while we sit here tonight, we will go into debt an additional $50, billion, $50 million in an hour and a half. 
Now, it's not the Republicans' fault, of course, and it's not the Democrats' fault, and what I'm looking for is who did it. Now, they're the two folks involved, so maybe if you put them together, they did it. Now, the facts are we have to fix it. We are leaving. I'm here tonight for these young people up here in the balcony from this college. When I was a young man, when I got out of the Navy, I had multiple job offers. Young people with high grades can't get a job. People, the, the 18 to 24-year-old high school graduates 10 years ago were making more than they are now. In other words, we were down to 18% of them were making, uh, the, uh, to, of the uh, 18 to 24-year-olds were making less than 12,000. Now that's up to 40%. And what's happened in the meantime? The dollar's gone through the floor. Now whose fault is that? Not the Democrats, not the Republicans. Somewhere out there, there's an extraterrestrial that's doing this to us, I guess. <laughs> and everybody says they take responsibility. Somebody somewhere has to take responsibility for this. In context of discussing the national debt, during the first debate, Ross Perot used a self-deprecating joke he would become famous for. He's all ears. I think it's fitting that we're on the campus of a university tonight. These young people, when they get out of this wonderful university, will have difficulty finding a job. We've got to clean this mess up, leave this country in good shape, and pass on the American dream to them. We've got to collect the taxes to do it. If there's a fairer way, I'm all ears. And speaking of legendary Ross Perot language, three times during the debates, when discussing the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, Ross Perot said sucking sound. Here's the second debate. We've got a $4 trillion debt, and only in America would you have $2.8 trillion of it, or 70% of it, financed five years or less. Now, that's another thing for you to think about when you go home tonight. You don't finance long-term debt with short-term money. Why did our government do it? To get the interest rates down. A 1% increase in interest rates in that $2.8 uh, tr uh, trillion dollars is $28 billion a year. Now, when you look at what Germany pays for money and what we don't pay for money, you realize there's quite a spread, right? And you realize this is a temporary thing and there's going to be another sucking sound that runs our deficit through the roof. And a second time during the second debate. To those of you in the audience who are business people, pretty simple. If you're paying $12, $13, $14 an hour for factory workers, and you can move your factory south of the border, pay a dollar an hour for labor, hire a young 25, let's assume you've been in business for a long time, you've got a mature workforce. Pay a dollar an hour for your labor, have no health care, that's the most expensive single element in making a car, have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement, and you don't care about anything but making money, there will be a giant sucking sound going south. And a third time during the third debate. Everybody's nibbling around the edges. Let's go to the center of the bullseye of the core problem. And believe me, everybody on the factory floor all over this country knows it. You implement that NAFTA, the Mexican Trade Agreement, where they pay people a dollar an hour, have no health care, no retirement, no pollution controls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you're going to hear a giant sucking sound of jobs being pulled out of this country right at a time when we need the tax base to pay the debt and pay down the, uh, the interest on the debt and get our house back in order. Ross Perot also demonstrated skills as a TV program promoter like during the second debate. If the American people send me up to do this job, I intend to be there one term. I do not intend to spend one minute or of one day thinking about re-election. And as a matter of principle, and my situation is unique and I understand it, I would take absolutely no compensation. I go as their servant. Now, I have set as strong an example as I can. Then at that point, when we sit down over at Capitol Hill, Tomorrow night, I'm going to be talking about government reform. It's a long subject. You wouldn't let me finish tonight. If you want to hear it, you get it tomorrow night. But the point is, <coughs> sorry, just a little silly. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, if you, you're here tomorrow night. And in his closing statement in the third debate. These next two weeks, we will be going full steam ahead to make sure that you get a voice and that you get your country back. This Thursday night on ABC from 8.30 to 9, Friday night on NBC from 8 to 8.30, and Saturday night on CBS from 8 to 8.30, we'll be down in the trenches under the hood working on fixing the old car to get it back on the road. And in the third debate, Ross Perot demonstrated an understanding of how the media operates. You've got to go to the people. I just love the fact that everybody, particularly in the media, goes bonkers over the town hall. I guess it's because you will lose your right to tell them what to think. The point is, they'll get to decide what to think. Hey. 
Yeah. You got something there. What you have been, I, I love the fact that people will listen to a guy with a bad accent and a poor presentation manner talking about flip charts for 30 minutes because they want the details. See, all, all the folks up there at the top said people of the attention span of the American people is no more than five minutes. They won't watch it. They're thirsty for it. Finally, Ross Perot twice cited a legendary band leader who played the accordion, Lawrence Welk. But, but, See, let me make it very clear. If people don't have the stomach to fix these problems, I think it's a good time to face it in November. If they do, then they will have heard the harsh reality of what we have to do. I'm not playing Lawrence Welk music tonight. That was from the first debate. In the third debate, he was asked about his experience with General Motors. He had been a director of GM and its largest stockholder. Ross Perot again cited Lawrence Welk. I think the General Motors thing is very relevant. I did everything I could to get General Motors to face its problems in the mid-80s while it was still financially strong. They just wouldn't do it. And everybody now knows the terrible price they're paying by waiting until it's obvious to the brain dead that they have problems. <laughs> now, hundreds, thousands of good, decent people, whole cities up here in this state are adversely impacted because they would not move uh, in a timely way. Our government is at point now. The thing that I am in this race for is to tap the American people on the shoulder and to say to every single one of you, fix it while we're still relatively strong. If you have a heart problem, you don't wait till a heart attack to address it. So the General Motors experience is relevant at the point when I could not get them now to address those problems. I had created so much stress in the board who wanted just to keep the Lawrence Welk music going that uh, they asked to buy my remaining shares. I sold them my remaining shares. They went their way. I went my way because it was obvious we had a complete disagreement about what should be done with the company. And an historical footnote. In 1992, Ross Perot ended up with nearly 19 percent of the popular vote. In 1996, he ran for president again. But in 1996, they kept him out of the debates. Why? From September 17, 1996, here's Commission on Presidential Debates co-chairman Paul Kirk dismissing Ross Perot as entertaining. Our decision and that of our advisory committee was made on the, on the basis that only President Clinton and Senator Dole have a realistic chance as set forth in our criteria to be elected the next president of the United States. The application of the criteria to Mr. Perot and other party, third party or independent candidates did not result in a finding that any of them has a realistic chance to win the election. As we, we have consistently indicated publicly, participation is not extended to candidates because they might prove interesting or entertaining. The purpose of the commission is to bring before the American people in an unvarnished debate format, those candidates from whom the American people actually will choose the next president and vice president of the United States. And now a bonus clip, not from Ross Perot, from John Anderson. John Anderson is the only other independent candidate to participate in a televised general election presidential debate. He was a Republican congressman from Illinois who, in 1980, bolted from his party to run as a plain-spoken independent candidate for president. On September 21, 1980, he debated Ronald Reagan one-on-one. -on -one. President Jimmy Carter refused to join that debate because he did not want to be perceived as taking John Anderson's candidacy seriously. Then John Anderson's poll standing dropped below 15 percent, and he was not invited back for a second debate. That debate, in October 1980, was the only one between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. Which leads us back to Ross Perot. Eleven years later, on November 2, 1991, Ross Perot was a featured speaker at a forum on incumbency in the U.S. Congress. The forum's title, Throw the Hypocritical Rascals Out. Ross Perot was introduced by John Anderson. But it's because he feels so deeply about these things, because he has no personal agenda, I've heard him say, as a matter of fact, and maybe you heard him say as well, I'd just as soon be a dollar a year man in Washington and forget about the dollar. It isn't because he is seeking advantage, because he is seeking position, because he is seeking power, 
but because he believes deeply that certain things have been lost sight of in recent years, some pretty basic important things that are necessary to restore and to reinvigorate the health of this great country that I am proud to be able to be on this platform with him this afternoon and to introduce to you uh, a great American patriot, H. Ross Perot. And here's how Ross Perot responded to John Anderson's introduction in 1991. He used a line you heard earlier in this podcast. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for that very generous introduction. Well, there's good news and bad news. The good news is I don't charge anything to speak. (laughs) And the bad news is I don't have a speech writer. That may seem all right now, but by the end of the speech, you'll say, where's Peggy Noonan when we need her? So, uh, but whatever, <clears throat> everything you get comes straight from the heart. And I've labored over this one. That's it for this episode of C-SPAN's The Weekly. A reminder, you could do your own searches in the C-SPAN video library. Lots more to remember about Ross Perot, who died five years ago next month. Just go to cspan.org and type Ross Perot in the search bar on top. Ross Perot famously said he's all ears. See those ears? and his charts in the C-SPAN video library. For now, thanks for listening, happy searching, and we'll close out with the music Ross Perot played on November 2nd, 1992, his election eve rally in Dallas as he danced with his wife. The song, written by Willie Nelson and turned into a hit in 1961 by Patsy Cline, Crazy. Now, while we're on the crazy theme, Ed, could you... See, I've got a theme song for our campaign. And here it comes. Just listen to it. We're crazy. (laughs) Crazy for feeling so lonely. We're crazy. Crazy for feeling. Now don't worry folks, we got buses lined up outside to take you back to the insane asylum right after this over, be all right.